Hi and welcome to the fourth lecture in summer course introduction to game programming 1DB 437 at the Linnaeus University and my name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck and today we're going to talk about rendering and the graphics engine. So a large part of the game is rendering a three-dimensional space onto a flat two-dimensional screen. We only have two dimensions on our screen and we have a 3D world and we need somehow to convert a 3D world to a two-dimensional screen. A rendering is performed by the graphics hardware and it can be done a bit differently on different hardware platforms and different manufacturers. But there are some common principles used by your rendering hardware and we're gonna look into and discuss those in this lecture. So, some fundamentals. First thing we need to know about are buffers. So, we have two buffers, the frame buffer and the back buffer. The frame buffer is where what is shown on the actual screen is stored. This is what we see on our monitor. And in many standard window-based computer applications, the GUI contents are drawn directly on the frame buffer when we have some windows, if we have applications like Word or, or whatever applications we are using. In 3D games, this is, however, not feasible, since then the user can see the frame being constructed, because it takes noticeable time to draw a new frame, because we need to convert the game world from 3D to a 2D screen space. So instead we construct the frame on a non-visible area called the back buffer and when the frame construction in the back buffer is finished the back buffer is copied to the frame buffer which is a very fast operation. So we render it on, on a visible buffer and when it's finished we copy it to the visible frame buffer. And there are several benefits of using the back buffer. The most obvious one is that the user cannot see the frame being constructed. We see it directly when it's finished. Another benefit is that the graphics card can manipulate instead of merely copying the back buffer to the frame buffer. And a common manipulation is that the back buffer can have one fixed, often high resolution. And if we have low resolution screen, we can compress the frame to fit the screen resolution, resolution of the current hardware. And then, regardless of your hardware, the game engine can use the same size of a back buffer, even if you have a fast or a slow computer. And when compressing an image of high resolution to a low resolution, uh, things can happen. We can see some visible distortion artifact, which is known as aliasing. And therefore, rendering engines often use anti-aliasing techniques to minimize these artifacts. So consider this triangle, the yellow triangle in the figure, and if we compress it to the grid, a lower resolution, it will not really look like a triangle anymore. It will look very weird, the brown shape, brown shaped here. So we need some way of smoothing out the object to fit a lower resolution, and that's called anti-aliasing. When drawing a 3D scene, the rendering engine has to the rendering engine that no fully or partially hidden objects are visible in the finished scene. So if something are hidden from the camera, we don't want to render it. Uh, for simplicity, we assume that no objects are transparent. If we have transparent objects, of course, we will see something behind them. And this may sound simple, but if we shall do it efficiently, it's a complex task. Which objects are visible and which are not from the current camera point? In the most naive approach, we render all objects in sequence, starting from the back of a scene and moving forward, so the forward objects are rendered on top of the back objects. But this is very inefficient since we render a lot of objects that are not visible. And the process of sorting objects based on depths is also a very time consuming and not so simple task. A major problem with this approach is if we have a cage, for example a bird cage, the bird or whatever is inside the cage is neither behind nor in front of a cage but it's still visible. This can be problematic when sorting objects based on depth. Then maybe 
the bird will not be visible at all because it's inside another object that has some uh, gaps which we can see through. The most common approach used today for depth calculation is to use a second invisible buffer which we call the depth buffer, or sometimes the z-buffer, since the z-axis often represents the depth in a 3D scene. And for each pixel that is written to the back buffer, when we render the pixels, a depth value for that pixel is written to the depth buffer. So we use two parallel buffers. And the values in the depth, depth buffer indicates how far away pixels are. And when we render a new object at the same position, the depth of a new object is compared with the depth stored in the depth buffer. And we can either write over render the new object on top of the other or reject the new object or some pixels in the new object because we are behind the old object. So if the depth value of a new object is less than the stored value, the new object is closer and the new pixel and depth values replaces the old. If the depth value of a new object is larger than or equal to the stored value, the new object is farther away and the new pixel and depth values are discarded. A major benefit with this approach is we don't have to render objects in a specific order based on depth. We just check the depth values on the current object we are rendering. And also since each pixel is evaluated separately, there is no problem with partially hidden objects such as the bird cages or other things. And the values in the depth buffer represents relative ordering based on depth. And they can, for example, represent a distance in meter or kilometers, but it's not a requirement. It doesn't have to have a meaning, these values. The meaning is simply that they have to define a relative depth. And the meaning can be defined by the development team. So an example, depth buffer, we have a house and the car shall be rendered to the back buffer. We start with rendering the house, the house shall be in front of the car. So these are the two objects we want to render. So the back buffer, we render the house and at the same time we write some depth pixels in the depth value, some depth values in the depth buffer. So the depth of each pixel in the rendered house is stored. And then we render the car and only some pixel of a car is rendered and the depth values of a house is closer than the depth values of a car. The car should be shown here. Sorry, I kind of missed copying it. But the car should be partially hidden and partially visible behind the house. And the pixels of a car that are behind the house which have higher depth values will be discarded. It's also quite common that we have a third buffer called the stencil buffer uh, and it's often interleaved with a depth buffer so we can use 24 of 32 bits for the depth buffer and the remaining 8 bits for the stencil buffer so we use the same int values for both the depth and the stencil buffer. Uh, and if interleave it's often called the depth and stencil buffer. And the stencil buffer can, similarly to the depth buffer, reject pixels. Uh, but its meaning is not as clearly defined because it's not defining any depth. It's just something called the really useful buffer, which we can use for special effects. And some common applications are windows, where we can value one inside the window, zero otherwise. So we will see some pixels from outside of a window and also rendering objects with reflections like mirror where objects will be reflected in other objects when we can use the stencil buffer. But it's up to, up to the game development team to define what the stencil buffer shall be used for. Coordinate spaces, we briefly touched it in the previous lecture. Uh, so we have the world and the object space, the global and local coordinate system. The game world is located in the world space and uses the global coordinate system. But game obje objects are often defined in their own object space using a local coordinate system. 
and before rendering an object the location and rotation of an object must be transformed from the local coordinate system to the world space. So here we have extensive use of matrix transformations. Otherwise the renderer does not know where an object is relative to other objects. To complicate things even more, a scene has a camera with a position and orientation and the camera decides what we are seeing on the screen. And the camera has some space in front which we call a frustum. And objects are only visible if they are fully or partially inside the camera frustum, otherwise they are outside of what we see on the screen. And when the camera moves or rotates, the frustum also moves and a new part of the scene will be visible. And the frustum is a volume defined by six planes, so something like here. We have a camera, we have a near clipping plane, and this is defines how, ob how close objects are to be rendered. Objects that are closer than the near clipping plane are not rendered at all. And we have a far clipping plane and objects that are farther away than the far clipping plane will also not be rendered. So we cannot see infinitely in, in the depth scene. But objects inside the frustum, which is made up on a top, bottom, lef left and right plane and the far and near plane are rendered on the screen. And the general aim is to have a near clip plane as close as possible to the camera. So we can see maybe objects that are really, really close, or objects that are farther away from the clipping plane. And the far clip plane should, of course, be as far away as possible, so we render as many objects as possible. If we have fast enough hardware, the far clip plane can be moved to infinity without causing any rendering artifacts. So we can see endlessly in the scene. Of course, objects will be so small that we don't render on them if they are too far away. And in large outdoor worlds with many objects, it might not be possible to pay, place the far clip plane at infinity on slower hardware and you can usually change that in the graphics setting in each game because there will simply be too many objects to, to render if we have slow hardware causing severe lag in the game. Uh, the, the frame rate, frames per second, will drop very low. The near clip plane is a bit more tricky because we only have a finite amount of precision in the depth buffer. 24 bits if we use the depth stencil buffer interleaved. And the major factor of how, factor of how its precision is distrib distributed is how close the near clip plane is. If we move a near clip plane too close to the camera, we will have possibly a lot of objects that are very, very close to the camera, and it can affect the precision of the depth testing, leading to very weird rendering artifacts errors. Where it should be placed depends on the game engine, and we can use a simple trial and error approach to find the most suitable distance. And of course it might not be very good to have the near clip plane too close to the camera, because then we can suddenly turn and we have an object just in front of us and we won't see anything except a very zoomed in object. Objects located near the edges of a camera frustum can be partially visible. And to render these objects, some triangles of the models have to be chopped in two parts because the tri triangle can be partially inside and outside the frustum. And the one triangle outside shall be discarded. And this process is called clipping and uses a special four-dimensional clip space. And it's, it's a very complex task and we'll not go into it into more detail. The hardware and graphics libraries hold that for us. So we have our game engine and if we use graphics libraries like DirectX and so on, we'll solve most of this for us. The final space is called tangent space, sometimes called the surface local space. Uh, and as we discussed in previous lecture, each triangle has its own tangent space containing the tangent plane of a triangle. And if we have a tangent plane, we can calculate the normal vectors for each triangle uh, which we need for lighting calculations. For example, to calculate shades, lights, but also to calculate collisions, we need 
the normal normal vectors. We also have something called textures and materials and the texture is a surface that holds data points which we call texels derived from texture pixel and the texel holds a color red green and blue value RGB and often an alpha transparency channel if we want transparent textures uh, and they are often written as RGBA texel values and textures are typically 2D arrays of texels which represent a picture that is mapped onto the triangles of a 3D object and it's used by a shader to calculate how the object looks like in the current lighting conditions and the current camera angle and so on. So we have the mesh of a dinosaur to the left, we only show the grey mesh and then we map some picture, a texture onto the dinosaur to make it a bit more alive, to give it some colors and and so on. So we map the texture onto the actual mesh. And to do that we use a shader and the shader is a small programming running on the graphics hardware. So it runs on the very well parallelized 3D uh, graphics card. And it's used to determine either the shape in a vertex shader or the color in the pixel shader of a mesh. So the two types, we have a vertex shader working on vertices and the pixel shader working on single pixels. And modern shaders are programmable and can also be used for other tasks such as creating special effects on web cameras and stuff. So we have two different shaders on this blue sphere here. We have a flat shading and we have a fong shading and they give different results on how um, the sphere is rendered on the screen. So the vertex shader runs for every vertex in the model and the pixel shader runs for every pixel. And since we have many more pixels than vertices, the pixel shader runs many more times per frame than the vertex shader. So if we can move calculations from the pixel shader to the vertex shader, we can improve the overall performance of our rendering engine. A material is a description of how to render a triangle and this data usually consists of associated textures, the reflectivity of a material and which shaders to use when rendering the triangle because we can use more than one shader to render a triangle even if we commonly use only one. And modern game engines have a wide range of different shaders to select from. So in Unity we can for example select between quite a lot of different shaders in the shader drop down menu where we have a standard and a standard specular and we can change between a lot of different types of shaders and some of them will be discussed in the practical projects. So different shaders give different results so this is from the uh, space shooter project the standard shader will show the laser bolt with a black background but if we use a particles additive shader all black pixels are considered transparent and we only see the actual laser bolt on the rendered screen, which is the effect that we are looking for. And we can also have a sphere where we have a standard shader, we could create a bluish sphere and we have a specular setup shader where some reflections are calculated in the sphere. So we'd see some blue sky color reflected in the sphere. An object can have one or multiple meshes, which allows it to represent objects with multiple materials. Uh, and the atomic operation of the hardware is to draw a set of triangles with a single material, uh, which it will do very, very fast. But if we have too many meshes, then you need to make many rendering calls because each time we change material, it takes some time for the hardware to adjust to a new material and it may affect the time it takes for rendering an object. So each time we change a mess, some setup time is required or change material. 
An example of where multiple meshes might be needed is for a human character. The character can have one mesh for the face using a shader optimized for skin rendering, one for the hands, the same shader but we use a different texture on the hands, and one for the hair with a special hair shader so it calculates how, how the hair looks like when the wind is blowing in the hair. And many more. We can have one shader for the clothing, etc. So, an example of a triangle mesh for a dolphin can look like this, and then we can put some texture on top of it to make it look like a bit more of a dolphin. Partitioning are also important in rendering, and we call it render volume partitioning. Uh, so, one way of speeding up collision detection, as we talked a bit about previous lecture is to partition entities into nodes in a grid or using a BSP tree or similar. And this reduces the number of collision checks needed and speeds up the collision detection step in the game loop. Since we can quickly rule out which objects are close uh, to other objects. And the same optimization principle can be used for rendering. So the depth and stencil buffer is used to react pi pixels but the triangles still need to be processed, so we process the vertices. But if we can completely avoid rendering objects that we know are not visible, it will speed up the rendering of the scene quite much. And the process of not rendering instances is called culling. And the most obvious culling is to ignore any instance that is outside the camera frostum, which is known as frostum culling. And other forms of culling is to find which instances that are completely covered by other objects, for example, characters that are inside a house and the camera is outside the house. And the easiest way to do this is to partitioning the game world using graphs or BSP trees, similar to the partitioning we discussed for collision detection. So partitioning the game world is very important for different steps in the game loop, collision detection, rendering, etc. So the BSP tree is a form of hierarchical partitioning. Root node is the whole game world. We split into two convex child re regions, children regions, split each child region into two convex regions, and iterate until no more regions can be split into two convex parts. And leaf node can be marked as hollowed or solid, and we can see which node are visible from which other node. And hollow nodes can have game objects attached to them. So the example we had, the BSP tree, where we divide it into uh, split the convex regions into two halves and continue until we have no more convex regions in the game world. And if we mark, for example, a leaf node, F in this case, as solid, it blocks visibility. So then instances in N1 cannot see instances in N2 and vice versa. So we can quickly skip rendering all the instances in N1 if a camera is in N2 because we know that F is solid, it blocks visibility between these two points, areas. Another way of partitioning of space is, is to use something called chord trees and it's also a tree data structure. And in chord trees each node represents a square in space aligned with the X and Y axis. A node can have either no children, when it is a leaf node, or four equally sized children. The square is cut into quarters. And quarter trees are typically used for very fast frustum culling when we rule out what is seen by the camera space or not. If a square is outside the frustum, none of its four children needs to be checked. So this is an example of a graphical representation of a quarter tree. All the larger squares, they doesn't contain any instances, but if it contains an instances, we divide it into smaller and smaller quarters until we are at the very small bottom level of this quad tree where we place the instances. So then we know that if we have no children in a large square, we know that there we are not any instances at all in the whole area and we can quickly go to the next area. But if we see that 
the area has some children and we can go down and see until we find any instances. We can also use something called portals, portals and in the portal system the game world is split into nodes, each occupying some space and the result is a graph data structure and each node is joined to one or more other no nodes by what is called a portal. And the portal is usually re represented by a planar convex polygon but can have more complex shapes. For example, we can use a capsule or, or a box. Rendering starts from the node the camera is in and all objects in that node is rendered and when we iterate through the portal to see what is seen. If a portal to another node is visible in the camera first dump, the objects behind the portal is marked as visible and we will render them. If a portal to another node is outside the thrust dome, the objects in the connected node is ignored. And portals are very useful for windows or door openings leading into buildings. So if we have a game world where the camera is and the house, we have defined some window portals and a doorway portal where if a window is open, we can see stuff inside the house. We can also use a data structure called the potential of visible sets. It's also a graph based system with nodes representing some space in the game world and each node in the PVS has a list of links to other nodes that are potentially visible from that node. And if a camera is in one node called N, the PVS system lists all other nodes that might be visible from N as visible. And the objects located in a visible node are rendered and in the not if a node is marked as not visible when we simply don't render them. And the only drawback with PVS is that it's very costly to generate the PVS set because it takes a lot of calculation if we want to calculate the PVS set and it might not be perfect for calculation as well so we might manually need to fix it. But it can be pre-generated by the game developers and stored on the hard drive so when we have created a level, a game world, we can generate a PVS set and store it on the hard drive and we can use it when we render the, the game, when the player is playing the game. The major benefit is that PVS quickly rules out invisible nodes. If for example 10 nodes are marked as visible, all objects not in any of those nodes are guaranteed to not be visible and can be skipped, so we can skip a lot of nodes. So this is an example of a PVS set uh, where we have the camera in the blue room, in the doorway of a blue room, and the orange parts are what is potentially visible from the camera point, and the green is not visible. So all of these are what we call a spatial partitioning scheme and there are many uses in games besides collision detection and rendering. They can be used by uh, the artificial intelligence engine to find potential shooting targets for a player. Another common use which I mentioned before is to see which entities that need to be updated and not. So they are very useful in games and uh, we can use any of them or we can do use combinations of them. That's also possible. And some schemes are faster than others. Portals are the slowest because we need to check the geometry of each portal which can be a, s a capsule or, s or a box for example. BSP trees and quad trees are hierarchical and the tree needs to be traversed until a lift node is found, found which is usually a very fast operation so we don't have to care that much about it. PVS sets does not require any hierarchical tree tra traversal at all and is the faster to use but they are very costly to generate. Portals have a benefit that they can describe more complex shapes such as doorways or windows than a BSP tree can. Quad trees are only useful for rough but quick thrust and culling to know which instances are seen by the camera or not. We must however keep in mind that all schemes are much more complicated and time consuming to implement by using a linked list for storing the game object. And in small worlds, if we only have a few game objects, it's not worth implementing a partitioning scheme. They're only needed in larger game worlds with many game objects.
and game developers must decide if a scheme shall be used at all for the game they are developing. So some more about textures. We briefly mentioned them, but there are some more things we need to, to discuss. So to recap, a texture is an array or 2D array that holds texels, and a texel holds a color, RGB, and often an alpha transparency channel, and they are written as RGBA. Textures represent a picture that is mapped onto an object. The pictures are often in a standard image format such as PNG, JPEG, or BMP. Textures often take up a large part of the memory needed for a game, uh, and uh, to, to optimize it, texels can have different precision, the number of bits used to hold each value, so don't use too many high precision textures if we don't need it. And rendering speed of an object is often directly related to the size of a texture, texel, so if we have low precision texels, it will be faster to render the object. And there are a wide range of different texture formats that we can use. Uh, so let's take a look at the textures used in uh, our Unity project, the Space Shooter projects. So each texture image has a size. In this case, the laser bolt has 128 times 128 pixels. And the laser bolt texture does not have an alpha channel, only RGB. We see 128 times 128 RGB and it uses the DXT1 format meaning that the texture is split into segments of 4x4 pixels and each segment requires 512 bits to store. Oh sorry, a bit aching in my back. Each segment is then compressed to reduce the texture size so the file size is only 10.7 kilobytes so it's a very small texture. The asteroid have, however it's a bit more complex and it has a 256 times 256 pixels and it also has an alpha channel RGBA and it uses the DXT5 format which is quite similar to DXT1 but it has a high precision alpha channel instead and there's also a DXT3 format which is the same except that it has a low precision alpha channel and the total file, so file size here is 85 times 0.4 kilobytes and which texture format to use depends on the quality we need for a texture and as a rule of thumb use the format with the lowest memory requirements that can store the texture image. If we don't require any alpha use DXT1, if low precision alpha is enough use DXT3, if we need high precision alpha use DXT5. There are some speed and flexibility advantages are using textures with sizes that are power of 2, so 64 times 64 128 times 128, 128 times 64, and some game engines simply reject texture with sizes that are not the power of 2. The most common format is to use 2D arrays with text texels as an image that are mapped onto the 3D objects. But there are also 1D linear array and 3D volume texel arrays. In the case of 3D arrays, the texture is still mapped onto flat triangles. It's simply just a way of storing the texel, so we can see it as a pile of images stored on top of each other. Another common format is cube map, where six squares are assembled in the shape of a hollow cube, and they can be useful for boxes and spheres. So it's a 3D cube, but there's nothing inside. It's hollow, so we just have pictures on the side of a cube. So a cube map can be here we have a cube map, map with the six sides and they are mapped to form a nice looking box in the game. Textures can also have a mip map chain and it's a sequence of the same picture but each is half a size in each dimension as the previous one. So we have a large one, we have half a size and we cut the size in two until we have a very very small texture. And as mentioned before when we reduce the size, when we shrink an image to a smaller size, we can have some serious aliasing artifacts which makes the texture look bad. bad. And mic mapping is a very effective approach for reducing these aliasing artifacts because we select the most suitable texture size when we render an object. <laughs> 
And MIP mapping can also be used for 1D and 3D arrays and cube maps, where the size for each measurement chain is halved in each dimension. So we have a cube map here that is half the size in the MIP map chain. A MIP mapping is very common and is one reason why it's preferred to have textures with sizes that are a power of two, because it's easy to cut them in half. Texture mapping means that we map the image the texture to a 3D model. So let's look at an example from the Space Shooter Unity project. We have a spaceship mesh model left. Here we have our spaceship and we have a 2D texture in the middle. And the texture must be mapped on the mesh to create the spaceship right bottom. So the renderer must cut out pieces of a texture and paste the pixels at the correct place on the 3D model. And there are two commonly used approaches for mapping a texture onto the surface of a mesh. The first one is called explicit mapping. It means that each vertex uh, where triangles meet has a texture coordinate composed by, of one to three numbers labeled U, V and W. 1D textures require only U, 2D, U and V, and 3D and cube maps all three. So here we have a 2D, so we have a U and V coordinate. And the texture coordinate values are linearly interpolated across the mesh surface because only the vertices have an explicit mapping and the pixels between two vertices are interpolated. And the interpolated co coordinate values are used to look up which texture in the texture to use at each position of the surface and make up a triangle. And commonly the 0, 0.0 to 1.0 range maps to the entire texture no matter how large the texture is. So we use a common floating point value to map textures to a model. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5 always maps to the center of a 2D texture. So this vertex here in the model maps to this point in, maps to the top point in the uh, uh, texture. So, and all of the vertices in the model maps to some coordinates, UV coordinates on the actual uh, texture picture. The other approach, which does not have a specific name, is to compute the texture coordinates at each pixel instead of interpolating them. And in practice, most hardware compute texture coordinates at each pixel, even if they are supplied at each vertex. The reason is that interpolation can sometimes be a bit difficult. And interpolation in world space is not the same as interpolation in screen space because we have some perspective uh, so it might not be very easy to linearly interpolate. Even if we use interpolation in world space, coordinates are calculated at each pixel in screen space. So perspective correction of a texture is needed for mapping onto a game object in screen space. So we have the texture to the left and it maps to, and we have a perspective depending on where the camera is located, the direction and angle of the camera in the screen space. So what happens when coordinates go outside the 0 0.0 to 0 0.1 range? This range covers the whole texture, so going outside this range goes off the edge of the texture. And what will happen is determined by something that's called the wrap clamp mode of the texture, and the texture can use different modes in different directions, for example one mode in U direction and another in B direction. And the most common wrap clamp modes are wrap, the texture is tiled so that multiple copies of a texture appear side by side. Going off the edge of a texture brings the renderer back to the other side. So 0 0.2 minus 0 0.3 translated to 0 0.2, 0 0.7. So we just put the different pictures after each other. Clamp means that the coordinates are clamped to a 0 0.0 to 0 0.1 range. Going over the edge simply repeats the last texel over and over again. So if we go outside the range 8.3 here we use the 0 0.1, the last pixel in the texture. Mirror, similar to wrap, but each time we go 
of the edge, the texture is mirrored, the flipped in the respective direction, and when we go back, it flipped back and forth again. Mirror runs is similar to mirror, but only in the range minus one to plus one. Outside, it behaves like clamp, so we only mirror it once, then we take the last texel in, in the texture. And it's very useful for textures that are symmetric, like a star or a filled circle, where only a quarter of a texture needs to be stored. So we can have a quarter of a circle, and then we can mirror it in X direction and in Y direction. And the final one is a border color. It's similar to clamp, but instead of repeating the last texel over and over again, we specify a border color which is used for if we go outside the bounds. So we don't return any coordinates, instead we use a border color. When mapping a square texture onto a non-square mesh surface, or when rotating or shrinker a texture, some artifacts can appear which make it look bad. And the most simple approach when calculating a texture coordinate is point sampling. We simply use the texture color at the coordinate we have calculated. But point sampling is very sensitive to artifacts. So let's look at an example. We have an A times A texture where we have red on the left side, yellow on the other side, and we have some orange in the middle. And if we sample it on A times 8 pixel, it looks correct. But if we sample it on 4x4 pixels, the smooth orange precision suddenly disappeared and we have a very sharp edge between the red and yellow instead of the orange, the smooth orange. Uh, so point sampling makes, often makes textures look bad when we shrink them. So instead we can use something called texture filtering to smooth the sharp edges of textiles. The hardware usually use some type of filtering and the most common one is to look at the nearest few texels to the sample point and blend the color of these texels together. And the closer to the sample point, the more influence the texel color has when we blend it. And the most simple one is bilinear filtering. It's one of the most common types. It uses the nearest four texels to construct the color for a pixel. So if we take point sampling one position and bilinear interpolation, we check the surrounding texels in both the U and V direction, therefore the name bilinear interpolation. So we interpolate between four texels instead of picking the color value of one. Trilinear fil filtering is an extension of bilinear. It also performs linear interpolation between two entries in a mipmap chain. And this is done by doing bilinear filtering on two mipmap entries and then interpolate between the two results. So we do a bilinear interpolation on one mipmap and on a second mipmap and then we interpolate between the two. So if we for example have a surface of a size 82 times 92, we use the 128 times 128 and 64 times 64 entries in the mipmap chain and we interpolate between those two. And it does two bilinear filtering operations plus an interpolation, so it's computationally more expensive than the standard bilinear filtering. The result is however often worth the extra cost. There is however one major problem with MIP mapping, and it happens when we consider, for example, a road leading far away. Closest to the viewer, the road may be 500 pixels wide because we are very close standing on the road, very close to the camera, and at the far end of the viewing distance it may only be 10 pixels wide because it is smaller when going into the dis far distance. A MIP mitting might choose to use the 16 times 16 version of a texture or the 512 times 512 versions of a, of a texture. Vertically, this is probably no problem but horizontally the texture will be very stretched. If we choose a large texture version, it will be very compressed at the far end, leading to severe aliasing artifacts, even with trilinear filtering. And if we choose a very small one, it will be very stretched at the near end, and it will also look very bad. And to solve this problem, we can use a technique called anisotropic filtering. 
and it's used together with trilinear filtering. And it uses the MIPAP version in the least filter direction horizontally and uses a very complex filter to reduce aliasing when reducing the size vertically. And it's very computationally expensive, often requires very fast hardware, but we res it gives good results in some cases. So we've only trilinear filtering to the left and trilinear with an isotropic filtering to the right. We see that the texture looks much better to the right. But it depends on the game and on the hardware if we want to use it or not. And often the players can choose which filtering to use in uh, the graphical setup to improve the performance of their game. Lighting is the final thing we're going to talk about today. And in a real world or virtual world, light shines on surfaces. And that light is absorbed, possibly re-emitted and reflected from a surface, and some light rays eventually reach the eye or the camera. And there are several problems we need to solve to create realistic lighting in a scene. The first one is what lights are shining on a surface. We need to calculate the position of light sources relative to that surface and check if a light source is fully or partially hidden by other geometry causing shadows. So how does the surface interact with incoming or incident light? That's the second problem. This is determined by the material of a surface and which shader is used if we want to reflect the light or simply absorb the light. A third problem, what part of the result of this interaction is visible to the eye? And in theory, this is not a very complicated operation. It's simply represented by a vector pointing from the surface toward the camera, but it can be very complex to implement this efficiently if we have a very complex model with lots of triangles, because we need to know the position of the camera, position of lights in the scene, and the material description of all surfaces. Lightning calculation takes place in the shaders. Both the vertex and pixel shader is involved in lighting calculations. And they need the tangent plane and calculate the normal to calculate the outgoing light from a triangle. So we need some light sources to be represented in the game world. And the standard way is that each light source is an infinitely small point, called point lights, and has a position, intensity, and color. And intensity is usually measured by the brightness of a diffuse white surface illuminated by the light source at unit distance, so a vector with a, with a magnitude of 1. And the brightness then falls off according to the inverse square law, so the incident color equals the light color multiplied by the light brightness divided by the distance to light squared. And in physics, intensity and brightness are two different quantities, but in rendering we often interchange the two terms because we don't need two terms. Intensity and brightness are similar. So usually we store a brightness value between 1 and 0, where 1 is the brightness of a 100% white object, so the brightest light we have. If we directly use the inverse square law to calculate the incident light on a surface, it turns out that we will have many very dark and many very bright pixels and few in between. And this is because if we use the real world calculations, uh, the human eye can adjust to current lighting situation and can also see a very large range of intensities. But computer screens have a limited range of intensities and cannot adjust as eyes can. So we need to modify it a bit. And to get around the problem, we usually set the minimum distance and use the distance to light instead of the square distance to light. So the equation will now look like that we clamp the distance between the distance to light and the light minimum distance and use the max values of those two. And the incident color is the light color times the light bright divided by the clamp distance, so we don't use the square of the distance. And to speed up calculation, we can also set the maximum distance, and beyond this distance, the brightness is so low that we can simply ignore all light sources without getting any visible effects on our scene. 
In practice, it's however not very important what equations are used to calculate the brightness. The game engine solves that for us. And we can simply play, or play around with different light sources in the scene until things start to look good. We can do it by trial and error. And in many games we often use multiple light sources. In uh, the Space Shooter project we'll use three light sources. In theory we can process the light sources one at a time using the equations for a single light source. But it can be too costly if we have too many light sources. We have many light sources in, in a game world. So, as in rendering and collision detection, we need to do something to speed things up. Much of game development has to do with optimizations to speed things up. So, in most scenes, we typically have one or a few main very bright light sources, and these lights are processed individually with high quality, so we calculate how they behave in the game world. And the rest of the light shall be processed in a fast and efficient way, and quality is not as important because they are very subtle lights. And a simple and very common way to do this is what is known as ambient light. And in ambient light, a small constant light term is added to all calculations of the incident lightning coming from the light sources. And it's based on the assumption that there is always some light bouncing around in the game world in random directions in the scene and illuminating every surface. It's not completely dark. It's there are some light bouncing around. And this models how lightning can be scattered or reflected many times, producing a uniform light effect in the scene. And it works quite well, especially for indoor scenes. For outdoor scenes, we can use something called hemisphere lightning, that's a better model. And outdoors, the direct sunlight is a major light source, and is modeled as a high quality directional light. A bright blue sky also produces some light and is modeled as a hemisphere or constant blue. So we add a small constant blue term to the sunlight. The ground also reflects sunlight as it's modeled as a constant brown hemisphere opposite the blue of the sky. So we add a small constant brown light. Or blue for ocean scenes or green if we have grass. So we add some constant light to the sunlight to to make the scene look a bit more realistic. One drawback of all this model is that it's assumed that the incident light does not vary over a surface. So one surface always reflects the same light. And this works fine if surfaces are small, for example a surface on a mesh for a character, but for larger surfaces such as walls um, on a house, uh, this approximation is often too simplified. Uh, and one example where this is especially apparent is if we have a if we mount a light source on a wall. The in incident light will then vary a lot over the wall surface, so we cannot use a, s a constant term added to the light. To get around this problem, we can use a very useful property for larger objects in many games. They do not move. They are stationary in the scene and the house is, in almost all cases, stationary. And if an object is stationary, we don't have to recalculate lightning every frame. Instead, we can pre-calculate the incident light directions and brightness and store them in a texture map, which is called a light map. So this is an example of a light map for a cube, how much of a light that is reflected on the different sides. And it can be pre-calculated. Unity supports pre-calculating lighting scenes using something called baked lighting. And once we have decided the amount of direction of incident or incoming light for a surface, the interaction of its light with the surface can be modeled. And this means to establish the color and number of light rays that the surface reflects towards the camera. And there are two main types of interaction. We can diffuse and specular lighting. Diffuse is a bit more not so sharp. Specular lightning is more sharp and can be used to reflect mirrors, used to model mirrors and similar glass balls or something. In diffuse lightning, the reflected light is emitted equally in all directions from the surface, 
This means that the result looks the same from every angle, it does not matter where the camera is. The only things that affect the appearing is the incoming light and the material of the surface. And the most basic and also most common diffuse lightning is called the Lambert lightning. So this is an example of a diffuse lightning in the figure of the blue sphere. And in Lambert lightning, the light that is reflected from the surface is proportional to the dot product of a surface normal and the incident light vector. So now we need the surface normal of each triangle. Light facing directly at the surface, facing down. The surface receives many photons and it's very bright, but light that shines with a large angle coming from the side, photons are spread out over a larger area and it's darker. And to use Lambert lightning we need to know the normal vectors of each surface and to know the normal vectors we can either calculate them at runtime but it takes some time or read the normals from a normal map. And a normal map is a texture applied to an object where each pixel RGB instead represents the normal vector x, y and z at each pixel instead of a color. So the R in the pixel means the x of the normal vector x component, g means the y component, b means the z component. So we can use the text, texture to store the normal vectors. So textures can be used for a lot of useful things in games. Spectral lighting, the reflected light bounces off in a direction that is closely related to the direction of incident light. So it's not these soft reflections that is produced by diffuse lightning, like here it's a very soft reflection. And therefore more light will be reflected in one direction than in others in con contrast to diffuse lightning. And one of the most simple and common models of spectral lightning is the Blin specular lightning. And we, it can be used to produce these uh, reflections from a glass ball or a mirror or something. And in specular lightning, blind specular lightning, the surface is treated as a collection of microfacets, facets, each facing in a random direction relative to a visible surface. So we have uh, the macro surface and we have a micro surface with these facets faced in random direction and we have a normals. And for a light to hit the camera, the normal of a micro facet must point towards the vector from the camera to the surface and this vector is called the half vector. So the light is coming here and we have the normal of a micro facet, it's the half vector and the light is uh, going towards the camera. And the micro facets are randomly oriented but not in a uniform way. In a perfect mirror all micro facets are oriented in exactly the same direction and for rough surfaces micro facets orientation are random. And the surface is brighter the more micro facets that are oriented towards the camera. So we calculate the number of facets that are oriented towards the camera to see how bright the surface is. So the four vectors, we have a light vector going towards the light, vector going towards the camera. We have a normal of a surface and we have a half vector which is the normal of the current micro facet. And the on a rough surface, the middle figure, the lights are spread uh, in, l in a larger area and on a smooth surface, light is more focused on a smaller area and it will be a brighter reflection. And in Unity 5, a more complex lightning model known as physically based rendering is used and it's a mathematically very complex model and it's out of scope for this course, but there are some good reading at Unity's website about uh, this uh, lighting model. And the ambient and specular lightning was used in previous Unity versions. So, to summarize today's lecture, a game object consists of a mesh of surfaces. On top of a mesh, a texture is mapped to give the object a nice appearance. Each surface reflects some amount of light depending on where the light sources are located relative to the game object. And rendering texture and light is a very expensive operation and we need to be aware of our pros and cons of the different rendering and light models available and select the most suitable models for our games.
and also try to optimize them as much as possible. So that's all for this lecture. Uh, the fourth lecture in the Introduction to Game Programming 1DV437 course. And my name is Johan Hagelbeck. Thanks for listening.